All right, hello everyone. I hope everyone can hear me. Welcome to one, two, three, four, five. I think this is the fifth talk of the semester of the Sound Studies Institute uh, series uh, in the 2021-22 academic year. So welcome. Uh, we're coming to you from Amasquatchia, Wisconsin, sometimes known as Edmonton, Alberta. Uh, which is in Treaty 6 territory, the traditional homeland of the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Diné, Ojibwe, Inuit, and many other indigenous people. Um, so sound and music have been created and heard here and celebrated for thousands of years and um, by many diverse people. And uh, tonight we want to humbly add our sounds to the history, um, uh, to this history with respect and solidarity. So. Uh, if you're here for the first time, uh, the Sound Studies Institute is a research institute at the University of Alberta. Um, we're interested in all things sound from all angles, um, including performance and artistic understandings of sound, music and sound art, uh, but also other human and non-human understandings of the role of sound. Um, and our lecture series um, often features um, work and research being done at the Institute by our affiliated researchers, um, but we also um, often uh, have guests to join us. Uh, tonight, I'm really uh, excited to welcome uh, Jesse Acorn. Um, so I first met Jesse, I don't know, it was several years ago uh, before, before he entered university. So he was pretty young <laughs> and um, still pretty young. <laughs> and he, um, you know, he learned, I learned quickly that Jesse was one of these rare individuals um, who, like me, is just a total vintage audio geek, uh, just really enjoys um, the vintage audio equipment, particularly analog recording devices and, and electronic musical instruments. And um, it's, it's rare to find somebody his age who's so into this stuff and also has like an intimate understanding of how these things actually work and can repair them. So I was, uh, it was just really fun to, to get to know him and uh, we've had him in to fix some of our old analog uh, equipment, and I've seen him perform on some of these things. So obviously, at Sound Studies Institute, um, we are really interested in these things, right? Um, especially considering that we do a lot of digitization work. So we're interested in a lot of these vintage recording formats. But because we have a strong connection to music, um, the Center for Ethnomusicology uh, and the Department of Music, obviously um, we're really interested in, in the development of new instruments. And this is an area that I teach in. So I have a particular interest in the history of uh, electronic musical instruments. Um, and as, as I noted last at the last talk, um, this is in some ways, Jesse's talk tonight is one of a trio of talks we've had this semester about new uh, musical instruments. Um, having a Courtney Brown here who talked about her hadrosaurian skull instruments, very new um, kind of research and new, new ideas about um, what a musical instrument can be. Uh, two weeks ago, we had DeAndre Stewart here who talked about digital musical instruments or DMIs um, and some of his philosophies around um, the invention and the use of these as an artist, as a performing artist. Um, and tonight we're gonna we're gonna go way back in into history, into early uh, 20th century uh, history of some of these uh, uh, musical instruments. And I believe that um, Jesse's going to focus on the history of tube-based um, all electronic instruments um, from roughly the 1910s to the 1960s or so. Um, and for those of you who don't know, um, usually when we talk about the history of uh, musical instruments that utilize technologies, uh, like electrical technologies, we tend to group them into sort of what we call electromechanical instruments, which are instruments that make sound acoustically, but they're amplified in some way. Um, I'm thinking of the Fender Rhodes or the Hammond organ, for example. Um, and then the other side of it is the electronic instruments, that is instruments that produce sound electronically um, from scratch and don't have necessarily an acoustical component, although sometimes they still do have an acoustical component too, as I'm sure Jesse could remind us of. But I believe Jesse's gonna be focusing on all electronic instruments, but, but the ones that are not created with transistors that use uh, tube-based um, uh, electronics. So um, that'll be really fun to hear about. Jesse, um, 
is currently a, a repairman and a direct a, a designer of electronics. Um, he collects um, old vintage equipment um, and has quite a, a a history at this point of being able to repair and has the the knowledge to repair a lot of these things. Um, when he was at the University of Alberta uh, pursuing his engineering degree, um, I know that the, in the in engineering a lot of the the students have as a final project, uh, they have to produce something, have to actually design and create something. Um, and Jesse approached me about being a client <laughs> and he said, I'd like to build you an analog synthesizer. And I was like, great, that's awesome. And so we met my office and I kind of specified some things that I would be interested in, uh, in having him do. And he turned around and made this really cool um, kind of microtonal um, organ-like instrument that was just really beautiful. So um, anyway, I'm excited to have Jesse here tonight. And um, I think I'll turn it over to him now. All right, well, thank you very much, Scott. Um, so this, just a few disclaimers to start with. This is my first time using Zoom, as a matter of fact. So if I, if I mess things up, I, I apologize, but I think I know what I'm doing. Um, and uh, I hope my internet will hold out as well. Uh, but uh, I guess we'll go ahead. And actually, Scott, you, you covered some of the stuff that I was going to cover right at the start anyway. So that, that, means, uh, that means we're off to a good, good start. And I can kind of skip over some of this. But let me just sh share the screen now. Uh, let me see here. OK. So, so again, what, what am I talking about when I say electron tube instruments? Well. These are instruments that use either vacuum tubes or gas-filled tubes or both to both produce and shape and uh, amplify their sounds. So indeed, there's, there's no strings. There are no uh, rotating wheels or anything like that. That's, these are the instruments that I'm talking about. And so this actually, incidentally, narrows the, the early developments to significantly. I mean, there were many, many early developments that were electromechanical that I'm going to completely ignore tonight. Um, but instead we're gonna focus on these all electronic tube instruments. So this is an example of what one looks like from the back. These are all vacuum tubes here and these are the heaters that are glowing, producing light. Uh, here's, here's another, here, let's see. Here's another example. This is an amplifier from an electro home organ. The, I wanna point out the purple glowing tubes on the right section and that those are gas filled tubes in this case being used for voltage regulation in the power supply um, but gas tubes can also be used as oscillators uh, and they can also be used as frequency dividers if those oscillators are synchronized to other to other signals um, and they can be used for gating they can be used for triggering they there are many different uses other than making light uh, but it's nice that they make light and that's part of what I like about these things. Um, so let's see. Here's another example. <laughs> these are neon bulbs. And, and in this case, this is a drum machine from the early sixties that, that uses neon bulbs as uh, to, to effectively program the drum patterns. Uh, they, this, is, this is another use for those. Um, but what I'm, what I'm going to start with very quickly, and I mean, this is a, this is a huge field. This is a huge topic that I, I mean, no one could really do a, do a complete job of covering it in an hour. But what I'm really wanting to do here is to pique some interest because it's a subject that I think is quite interesting, but a lot of people assume that, uh, or if they know about electronic instruments, they, they kind of think that things started in the 60s with, with Moog and Buchla and so forth, which well, I mean, some things did start then, but there, were, there was a lot happening a lot earlier on. And it might be an exaggeration to say millions of instruments, but probably over 100,000 individual units and many, many designs, hundreds of designs uh, that were commercialized alone. So we're going to very quickly go over the history of tubes. So the earliest tube was the Fleming diode. This was invented in 1904, but that a diode cannot actually amplify sound. Um, it can't really be used as an oscillator or in an oscillator circuit. But then in 19, 
1906, uh, Lee DeForest invented what's called the triode. So he took a diode and he put another element in, in between the cathode and the plate. And what that meant was that you could control the current flowing between cathode and plate with a, with a voltage. And you could effectively amplify a small signal into a big signal. And I mean, this made radio possible. This made, of course, TV and all these other later developments possible, but it also made purely electronic music possible. And so it's probably no surprise that, uh, that one of the very first instruments, I, I, this might actually be the very first, but it was never commercialized, was the DeForest Audion Piano. Now, <laughs> this is not an actual picture. This is just an artist rendering of what, of what this might've looked like. In fact, I couldn't find any actual pictures because again, this has never been commercialized, but uh, Lee DeForest himself figured out that he could use his, his Audion, this, this early triode as an oscillator. And he made an instrument that was a, apparently semi-polyphonic. There, there was one oscillator per octave and then that would, you know, you could play within that octave monophonically or play multiple octaves uh, polyphonically, which is a bit weird. Um, but, but yeah, this was, so this was 1915. And, and then of course the first world war happened. And during that period, there were, there weren't really many electronic instruments developed, but there were advancements in electronics for sure. And so it was really in the twenties that we started to see some really serious electronic instruments offered. And also, well, that was also the, the time when radio really took off and vacuum tube equipment really started to be a thing for, for many people. So, I mean, at this point, some people would go into the theremin. I'm gonna skip the theremin for a moment and we're gonna go straight to a different instrument, which is the Ons Martineau. Um, so this, there, there are a lot of interesting features of this instrument that, that have been pretty much ignored in keyboard design for a long, a long time, but I find quite, quite interesting or you know, electronic musical instrument design, synthesizer design, whatever you might call it. So the, the various models, there were many different models of this. Um, this is just one that I managed to find a picture of. They're not very well cataloged. Um, but the key, there are a few, th few important things to note about this instrument. One is that like many of the very earliest, um, this is a monophonic instrument that works by taking radio frequency oscillators and combining them and, well, heterodyning them. So you, you effectively get a, a signal that is the, between the, the two radio frequencies. And the reason that they did this very much in the early days was, was because it, uh, it was easier to produce the components that, that they require. They, the, um, they require much smaller inductances and capacitances. And so these were easier to make in, in those early days of electronics. And, uh, but th you know, that's just technical details. The main thing here is, is that this can be controlled. The pitch, first of all, can be controlled in one of two ways. The first way is with a, uh, here, let's see, I think I got the picture here. So it's the first way is with this ring. So this is a slightly later model, but they, they pretty much all, mostly all have this ring that you put your finger into, and then you can move this back and forth and control the pitch. And so it, you can make these nice sweeping glissande or glissandos, um, much like you can do on the theremin, except that you are controlling it in the, in one dimension instead of very finicky with uh, with a three dimensional position of your hand relative to an antenna. Um, so this this allows for again for, for these really nice sweeping sweeping uh, glissando legato melodies, uh, but then you can also play it straight on the keyboard uh, and the keyboard. In some of these instruments, you can move side to side to produce a um, manual vibrato. 
which is a very useful expressive thing that we're going to come back to. Um, but as well, what's, what's interesting here is this. So if you see in, in this instrument, there's a glass key on this little drawer. And the glass key is a, it's a volume key, basically. It, it, uh, you press it down and it gradually increases the loudness. And so you, with your left hand, you put it on there and you can tap the key very quickly to make a nice little staccato note, so, or you can swell on it very gradually. And uh, this, it, it uh, again, it's, it's similar to the theremin, but it's easier to control. And I think that uh, generally was, was made, I mean, you can't really do quite the same kind of, of thing on a theremin, especially in terms of having very quick notes, quick staccato and so forth. Um, you'll also notice on this panel, there are a bunch of switches and these are used for, first of all, selecting the, the timbres, which the Yon Martineau is a subtractive instrument. So you start with a, with a non-geometric, but harmonically rich waveform. Um, and then that gets, that's passed through, through some filters, which would be band pass, slow pass, high pass, et cetera. And then the other thing that these switches do is they route the signal to, to different speakers. And, uh, oh yeah, this is, so this is just, this is just the instrument. This is the very simple scheme of it, the block diagram. Um, you can kind of see some speakers. I think I have this next slide here. Yeah, here we go. So these are some of the speakers that were provided with these. Uh, the one on the right is pretty conventional, you know, just normal cone drivers in that. Uh, the one on the left is a, uh, well, they call it a, what did they call it? A resonant, no, uh, metallic, a metallic speaker. Uh, so it's, it has effectively a gong in there that, uh, that can be resonated by the output of the instrument. And then the one in the middle, you can, you, well, you can see right there that there are multiple strings and then those strings would, would sympathetically resonate with the, with the instrument's tones and can make some very weird otherworldly effects. And, uh, you know, so these are quite interesting and uh, not much experimented with afterwards, but you can hear if you listen to um, Olivier Messi and stuff, he, he makes some use of these, these different, uh, different transducer things. Um, and it can sound very beautiful. Um, let's see, that's that. Now, I, yeah, the theremin, I'll very briefly talk about, invented by Leon Theremin, who was, I mean, he did it while he was in the Soviet Union, and then he moved to the US. And this was, actually commercialized a year after the on Martineau and the first with the first model being from RCA in the US this uh, this one here which is uh, the AR 1264 and so again this is a monophonic instrument uses the heterodyned RF oscillators and uh, there's tons of info on this thing people people love it um, it's mostly because of how cool the the means of control is without touching anything at all. And uh, I don't know, I, I kind of like the ones better. Uh, now, here's another French example. This was this Couplet Givlet organ, 1929. These, so this was a very early, maybe even the first commercial all electronic organ and had a lot of influence on, on some later instruments that remain in the US especially. Uh, but this this is kind of taking the principle of a pipe organ and directly making it electronic. This is this is I mean they used one vacuum tube oscillator per note that the instrument produces, and I think also in some cases they used the um, it, it, we, you'd have multiple ranks of oscillators of the same pitch for the sake of having different different uh, tone colors, different stops, and also, you know, just for the sake of richness. Um, but as a result, the instrument 
in this in this picture here. Uh, this was the one that was installed in the it was Paris radio station. What is this? Post Parisienne radio station in 1932, and it had 75 stops and no less than 400 tubes, apparently. Um, and also uh, another unusual feature of this, of this organ was that uh, the, the tone colors were assigned their own speakers. You would have individual speakers with, with the uh, filter circuits directly preceding the, the cone speaker itself. And so that's why there are, or it's one of the reasons why anyway, that there would be so many so many speakers mounted here. I think, do I have another picture? No, I don't. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, um, that's an interesting organ. But unfortunately, I haven't found any recordings of it. And so we're going to continue here. So on Deline, this, this came later. This is 1941, but it's still, uh, well, this is sort of within the Second World War. Um, now this, it's similar to the Ons Martineau, but few key differences here. So one of them is that instead of having that volume key, you actually have pressure sensitive keys. So the depth of the key press actually affects the loudness of the note. Uh, so that is a very valuable thing as far as, you know, very ex expression goes. I mean, it's like being able to, to vary the amount of wind pressure in a in a horn or, or you know vary the the speed of or pressure of the bow movement in a in a stringed instrument and uh, incidentally the ondioline is uh did i put another picture in yeah so the pressure sensitivity of the keys plus the fact that the keyboard can be moved side to side to introduce manual vibrato, plus the very, very well-designed and well-chosen formant filters, as they're called, means that the ondioline is an exceptionally good imitative instrument. Now, I'm not gonna say that that is, should or should be the purpose of electronic instruments, um, but it is pretty uh, novel at, at the very least, that uh, that as I will show you in a moment, if it works, the uh, the ability of this thing to imitate certain instruments is absolutely remarkable. And uh, I'm going to talk. I'll talk very briefly. I think I have. Yeah. So formant filtering is an interesting thing, um, and this is also something that was pretty well forgotten about around the time of Moog because the idea was more to make unique sounds and you know the filters in those early synthesizers were had pretty simple characteristics and they weren't like unless you set them up very carefully they weren't designed to imitate particular acoustic resonances and so this format idea is that if you have an acoustic instrument, the body will have a certain one, or, you know, one or more, or at least one, and usually one, resonant frequency that that it that it's respond like it vibrates best at this frequency, and to either side, it doesn't vibrate very well, and there's also a certain bandwidth to the sides of that that center formant frequency as it's called and the bandwidth also is important to how it sounds so if you look if you look on the on the chart on the left here if you can see it um, the trumpet and the oboe have pretty well the same center frequency of their formant range but the the uh, the width here is is smaller on the oboe so that is at least one reason why the oboe sounds different from a trumpet, uh, but the, the the other thing is that you, I mean, if you if you the idea of the system is that if you understand the resonance of the acoustic instrument, and then you also understand kind of what what the signal is like that is fed into that resonating body, then you can 
electronically generate a similar signal. And then you can electronically make a filter that has about the same resonating properties. And so on the right here, you can see this, the upper portion here, this, the diagram, this is just a harmonic series of a sawtooth wave, which is really the most common kind of waveform used for performance stuff. Um, and then below that is the characteristic of a, of a given form and filter, which peaks at, a, at a 1000 cycles per second or one kilohertz, if you will. Uh, and then this shows you that at different frequencies, the, the harmonic content actually changes here. So if we have, if we have a signal at 125 cycles per second, uh, that's the fundamental, then the seventh and eight har harmonics here are, are highest in amplitude. Uh, whereas if we put in a signal two octaves higher, which is 500, then the second harmonic is highest in amplitude. And if we put in one with, that is an octave higher than that, then it's, then it's the first harmonic or the fundamental itself that is highest in amplitude. And this is kind of how acoustic instruments behave. And this is how uh, you can quite remarkably mimic them. And I'm gonna play now a video, I hope this works. Uh, this is from a demo record of the Ondioline. And just listen to these, to these sounds here. Le clavier expressif de l'ondioline permet d'obtenir des attaques différentes d'une note à l'autre. Voici tout d'abord avec un timbre violon une série d'attaques rappelant le coup d'archet martelé. Cet effet s'obtient sur l'ondioline par enfoncement rapide des touches du clavier. Voici au contraire une série d'attaques douces, obtenues par enfoncement progressif des touches du clavier. Voici maintenant un exemple dans les autres tone colors. So that was a pretty decent sort of violin-like stringed instrument, and here's some others. Basson. Trompette. So you can, whoops, but you can hear that those are some remarkable sounds and the, and you can hear just how, how useful, at least for a skilled player, the pressure sensitivity of the keys for swelling the notes and also the, the manual vibrato is, is just, you know, those are two very important ideas that uh, pretty much ignored for a long time. And maybe they're kind of, maybe they're kind of coming back, I don't know. But <laughs> anyway, things to think about. Uh, now I'm gonna talk about one of the most remarkable polyphonic instruments that came at about the same time, this is also before World War II. Now Hammond, of course, most famous for their tone wheel organs, which are electromechanical, so we don't care about them. Uh, the Nova Chord, however, is an electronic instrument, except for the vibrato oscillators, which are electromechanical, but who cares? Um, all the tone generation is electronic, and a few things to note about that. This is the very first commercial instrument to use uh, a frequency divider system, meaning that you have 12 master oscillators that run at the highest octave um, of, of each pitch class. So, you know, C, C sharp, et cetera. And those master oscillators continuously run and the, they are followed by a series of dividers. And the dividers are synchronized to the oscillators such that they produce a signal that is exactly half the frequency. And, uh, you can just chain them all together to, to, to produce as many octaves as you happen to need. And on the Nova chord, these, these dividers happen to produce kind of sawtooth-ish waves. They're kind of rounded sawtooth things. They're, um, you know, they're not perfectly geometric. And that's actually one of the reasons why tube-based instruments and, you know, the very earliest solid state stuff tends to have, it be distinguishable and, you know, somewhat unique as compared to to later synthesizers, which were always trying to generate geometric waveforms at the very start. Um, but the Nova chord, 
you have not only that divider system and you have one note for each key, yeah, you have enough dividers to have that, but then you have a control tube for every note. And this control tube is a, is a, is a controlled amplifier and each key has its own envelope circuit which is completely passive, by the way. There's just the, I mean, the tube is only there as a control element and the, the circuit that, uh, that generates the envelope is all passive and yet it is able to produce some envelopes that we'll see in a few slides here, remarkably similar to ADSR envelopes and, and very versatile. Um, so I'm just gonna show you first, this is an image with the, with the top off, you can see, you can't even really see how many tubes there are here, but there are in fact 163 uh, tubes in 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 a, in a Nova cord. Um, so it's it's rather rather large, uh, even even as far as tube organs tend to go. And it's not really an organ. The thing about the Nova cord is that it's it's really it, it wasn't intended to be imitative or directly imitative of anything. It was its own instrument, pretty much, and it really has a distinctive sound. Um, but you can see this upper section is the generator chassis. And then below there's the, the, uh, amplifier and power supply. And, uh, you know, it shares, it has some similarities to organ and even to piano. It has a sustain pedal. Uh, but if we, if we look here, see, so here are the, the envelopes. Um, you can see that if you, I mean, the, the, the envelope control is a, is a potentiometer. It's just a single control, it's a, it's a knob, and it can go between these extremely quick, uh, you know, you have a super fast attack and a, and a quick decay, kind of like a, a very, uh, a, a very, a pluck string, like a banjo string or something like that, right? And then it can go from that to a very gradual attack and a high uh, sustain level in ADSR terms. Um, that is much more reminiscent of, you know, orchestral strings or something like that. Now I'm gonna play a demo video, uh, actually, no, not yet. Uh, so, and then it also, it takes the output from all that system and, and puts it through these, these filters. Now what we're looking at here is basically, I mean, you can feed through the signal directly. That's the full, full tone control here. Uh, you, can, you can have a high pass filter, which is brilliant. You can have a low pass filter, which is deep tone, and then you can have these band pass uh, filters, which they call resonators. And these are tuned to just some, you know, arbitrary frequencies, 425, so I can predict an 880, 2500. Um, so they're not, again, these, these are not trying to imitate specific instruments, um, but they, 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 you know, they're musically useful. And, uh, and uh, yeah, so let me play, a, little video here this is one of my favorite demos and, and especially what you what you should listen to is he he does he changes the envelope and he also uh he also does some uh excuse me listen to the difference in vibrato there's actually six vibrato oscillators in this thing and each one goes to two adjacent notes uh so listen to the difference in vibrato frequency on different notes i'm gonna play just a little bit of this listen to that for a while but but it's a nice it's a nice sound i, I like it quite a lot uh hammond was responsible for other developments including the solo box uh now this is a monophonic instrument and this was it has a weird looking thing here it's you have the tone cabinet here which has the the generator which uh, probably the most remarkable thing about that is that it's a divider system but the dividers are are a different kind than in the Nova chord. They're what are called bistable multivibrators. And what those produce is uh, they produce square waves. 
And the nice thing about them is that they can synchronize over a very wide range of frequencies. And so you can have, uh, you know, the master oscillator go all, all over the place and it, it'll, it'll be all right. Um, and that's what happens here is that the master oscillator varies and the dividers all, all uh, synchronize themselves to that. And you can, you have in total four octaves that you can, that you can add together or footages in organ terms, uh, you know, eight foot, four foot, et cetera. Um, but the reason it looks weird like this is that this was intended to be mounted on the underside of an acoustic piano. This was intended as an attachment for, for a piano. And there were actually quite a few instruments that, that were like this. Uh, in, I think they were all kind of influenced by Hammond. Um, Hammond's, th this was another instrument that was not intended as a, an imitative thing. This is its own kind of novelty or, or unique device. And um, it, uh, it, it developed into something which is this, the chord organ. So the chord organ it was uh, introduced 1950, so a little bit after World War II. And I'll just take a little bit to talk about what, uh, what happened. So before World War II, there were some electronic organs, um, including the original Hammond organ. But it was really after World War II that there was a huge boom in electronic organs and electric organs in general. Um, and Hammond was to some degree leading the charge, but there were many other manufacturers that were, some of which we'll talk about a bit later, in fact, pretty soon. Um, but one of the things that, that really, that was very successful for Hammond was this chord organ. And what this is basically is a solo vox or a slightly reduced solo vox, which, um, you know, it is a, is a monophonic instrument with pretty, pretty good variety of, of tones. And uh, it, it's that combined with a semi polyphonic organ section. And I say semi polyphonic because they, they use uh, the same oscillators for several adjacent notes either one or, or either two or three adjacent notes. And those are Hartley oscillators, which are, by the way, very stable. Um, these instruments, you'd be surprised how, how stable the oscillators tend to be because they really cared about that. And they, they, a lot of them are um, LC oscillators or, or inductance capacitance oscillators, which means that their frequency is almost completely determined by those, the, com the values of those components. And so if those, as long as those don't drift around, then the supply voltage can drift around and, and the tubes can drift around and the frequency is not really gonna change. Uh, but that, you know, whatever. The, 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 the really funny thing about this is that this was an early attempt at a, a really easy to play kind of instrument. So you have the manual here, which is pretty normal, but then you have on the left, a, a bunch of chord buttons and those, are kind of like on an accordion, uh, except for one thing, which is that A, there's, well, a different arrangement of them. You have all the, all the notes arranged in a sort of circle of four, circle of fifths thing. And then you have quite a variety of chords, a bigger variety than you have on an average accordion. But what's especially funny is they have a divider system to produce the root and fifth of those chords on the two pedals. So you pl play the left pedal and it produces the root of the chord and then you play the right pedal and it produces the fifth. Um, anyway, these are actually, this, so, I mean, in the, in the beginning part of this talk, you might've been thinking, well, okay, this is all you know, pretty cool, but, but when am I ever gonna come across something like this? Well, <laughs> now we're getting into stuff that you can find often for free or close to it locally on classifieds such as Kijiji and, and Facebook Marketplace. I mean, I got this one from a friend who got it for free and I've got multiple others of these. I had one of these that was even in better shape that was free on the side of a curb in St. Albert. And I fixed that up. It, it had almost nothing wrong with it. They, they often have almost nothing wrong with these. 
these code organs. But what, what I should also emphasize is that organs are, I mean, it's, it's kind of a mistake to think of these as, as either comparable to pipe organs or as comparable to, um, to organs that, that are very common on those classifieds. I mean, people lump them in with, with all these instruments that were made later on that are rather, I mean, they're, they're, they're more sort of home entertainment devices. These, these very sort of flimsy, cheesy particle board, uh, you know, 1970s organs with, with loaded with drum machine presets and auto bass and auto chords and all that. Um, so people don't really distinguish between those and these earlier instruments that are built to a higher standard, especially in terms of serviceability. These are very easy to fix as long as you kind of know, well, you know, they're, they're, they're easy to fix. I'll just say that. Um, but we will, so I'll, now I'm gonna go through several of these. Um, first of all, the Baldwin. Now, this was really the first, first really successful divider-based organ other than the Novacord. I mean, the Novacord wasn't really an organ, but this one was trying to be, trying to compete in the same field as pipe organs. And the, um, the key thing about this is that, well, there are a few really key features. One is that it's a divider instrument and the dividers are what are called blocking oscillators and they produce extremely good sawtooth waves. And so they have the sawtooth wave signals that are then passed through formant filters, you know, kind of like what, what we just saw with the, with the ondioline. And um, the other thing about it that's also kind of similar to the ondioline is that it has resistive key contacts. So the contacts here, it, again, you pressure sensitive keys where you, you press it down gradually and it, it gradually increases the loudness. Now their reasoning for this was that if you played it like a normal pipe organ, you'd have a very a quick, but not instantaneous attack and, and uh, you know, release or whatever you want to call it to the, to the note. You, you press the key and, um, and it's not just on off. You don't get a key click like you might on well, a Hammond organ. Um, but you know, that means that if you, if you want, you can play it quite expressively by varying the pressure right on the keys. Uh, and the model five was the very first uh, of, of these in instruments that Baldwin produced 1946, but the, I happen to have a model 45, for, which was started in 1953. And it's basically the same thing, except a little bit reduced and with built in speakers and, and an amplifier. The, the, the Model 5 was only intended to be used with external cabinet, which uh, I mean, you'd think they'd have room for all that in there, but and they did, but <laughs> they decided to, to make it uh, external. So I'm just gonna, so this is, again, this is the Model 45. I fixed this one up. The resistive contacts are a pain uh, because they do wear out. Uh, they are rated for how, well, how many, like 3 million cycles each, but this one had been used heavily, heavily in the church. And um, so I had to, I had to actually shift the contact material over. I had to saw the board and, <laughs> and shift. It was quite a thing, but this is the back. You can see the upper sections, the generators, these, and, and the vibrato generator on the very left and the amps down in the corner. And uh, also Baldwin did a cool thing where they, they have, uh, a subtraction of the four foot sawtooth waves from the eight foot sawtooth waves at, at half amplitude, the four foot, and, and it produces effectively a square wave, which is then the most useful for, for producing a uh, woodwind tone, a clarinet like tone. Um, so and I made a few very quick recordings here of, of uh, what this sounds like when you are playing the, the key contacts gradually. Uh, so if I play this one here. And you 
can you can kind of hear as well that the the timbre changes a little bit as the note fades in, and uh, and that's because the the taper of the resistive contacts is not exactly the same between the uh, between the different footages. There's you know it'll you'll end up at the right timbre in the when the key is fully depressed, but between then it might change slightly. So that's another really subtle but uh, but nice character of, of this kind of instrument. Uh, here's here's playing chords on it. This is swelling. It has it has an interesting sound, not very pipe organ like. Although it would be better if it had, you know, if it was in a nice reverberant hall or something. Um, but you can see why those who are trying to achieve pipe organ sounds didn't really like these terribly much. Um, now this, on the other hand, this the con organs, the earliest ones of which are called con sonata. Uh, those organs can give a much more pipe like sound. Um, and to discuss why this is, let me just, I'm not really using my notes, but I'd like to be in the right place here. So yeah, the first, the first one of these instruments was introduced in 1947. That was the model 22A con sonata. And this instrument is really quite similar to the couple Givle organ from France in the in the late 20s because this is not a divider organ. Con, at least in the tube era, did not make divider organs. Um, each note has its own oscillator. And not only that, but on, on at least the more fancy models like this one, which is an 811, this was 1958. This one belonged to a CBC in Toronto and I, I got it a while ago. Um, this has multiple ranks of oscillators as well. So it has a rank for the upper manual, a rank for the lower manual, and a rank for the pedal board. And uh, there, there are several advantages to this. One is that because you have individual oscillators, the octaves are not perfectly in tune. So when you have uh, coupling to, to the you know, if you have multiple octaves of the same note sounding at the same time, there is richness there. It's not just a static sound. It, you know, there, there are, there's a certain changing of, of the sound over time, um, which sounds very nice. And it also sounds more pipe-like because of course pipes are not perfectly in tune. Um, and then it's nice to have multiple ranks because then you can have even sounds that are at the same pitch that can be sounded at the same time, uh, but that are slightly, again, slightly different in tuning. And that also adds richness. And um, the other thing that's quite interesting about Khan is that they, they have two signal paths. Uh, one is, well, they have at least two signal paths, but, but what I'm trying to say here is between, they separate flute signals and string signals. So the oscillators that they use, these individual oscillators are Hartley oscillators. And if you take the signal from the cathode circuit or the plate circuit, in this case, they use the cathode circuit, uh, it's, a, it's a lumpy pulse wave. Again, it's, you know, it's not a perfect geometric waveform, but it's a, <laughs> it's, it's a harmonically rich waveform uh, that, is, that they can then design their own form and filters for. Uh, and then, the flute signals are taken from the coil uh, or from the from the tank circuits, and those are very pure. Those are almost sinusoidal, um, and so you you can have you can think of it sort of like a, a combination of an additive and a subtractive principle. Because usually, if you're using the flutes, you're going to add them together in octavely related or even you know harmonically related ways. Because there are a few what they call mutation stops on these organs. Um, but the, 
the what am I trying to say? You can also use, of course, the the strings like you would, uh, or you know, they 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 call them strings in the signal path, but they they have the stops have names that are both string related and and read related. You know, you you definitely have an oboe in there, and uh, and so that's kind of interesting. But also in this particular instance, it's a bit funny because you have these two Leslies. Uh, one Leslie gets the upper manual, one Leslie gets the lower manual plus pedal board. And these Leslies, each one is two channel. So one takes uh, the flute signal and applies it to the rotating section. And then the string signals go to fixed speakers because they figured that the strings would just be too crazy if you put them into the rotating, if you put them in the rotating speaker, which I, I, I kind of agree with them. I, I think that the flutes, it does sound nice when you have only the flutes going, going through the rotating horns in the Leslie. Um, now let's see, the con, so this is a smaller con organ. This is a, a 430. This one's actually hybrid. This has transistor flute keying for, to have sustain. Uh, but I'm gonna play you, this is a, recording I made for my aunt's wedding of this con organ and it has a bit of digital reverb. Uh, this is the 811, the big one. I'll just play it. So, you know, it's kind of pipe-like, uh, but it's also kind of not. It's, it's really, you know, it's somewhat unique. You won't really get the, quite the exact same sound from any other, other instrument. And uh, now we'll talk very briefly. This, the Lowry organs are some of the least pipe-like vacuum tube organs. Part of it is because they really weren't going for that. Uh, they were always, and uh, their principle was a divider system, but they were always very stingy with the number of generators. Oh, it says my internet connection is unstable. Okay, we'll, we'll ignore that. Um, they were stingy with the generators. And so they used all these odd tricks to try to compensate uh, for having a bare minimum of, of actual tone generator circuits. Uh, one of those was, just fold back so they would just repeat notes on on the keyboard uh which is a bit you know that's that's the least clever way to do it and it's also a bit annoying uh but they also have on the on the low end of a manual they might have a solo divider they call it so you'd have a frequency divider that is just serving a certain section of the the manual on the low notes. And so if you want, when you're playing in that region, you, you know, if you're playing one note at a time, it'll sound normal, but you can only play one note within that region. But it, you know, it might save 12 tubes and only use one tube uh, to, to do that. And similarly, they have something that they call frequency doublers. And when I first heard of this, I, was, I thought, well, well, what the heck are they doing? How, how can they do this and not only do it, but can actually take those polyphonically doubled. You can, you can put in as many notes as you want. Well, the way it does this is because while the dividers produce square waves because they're uh, these bistable dividers, then they use two, two uh, tube sections each, or, you know, basically two triodes, but um, th those dividers are costly. That's why they only have the bare minimum. The, the master oscillators on the other hand are Hartley's because they're so stable. And Hartley oscillators, again, they produce sort of a lumpy pulse wave. And that can actually, that has a very strong second harmonic. And so if you take the master oscillator signals and you bandpass filter them like crazy, you just take a certain range, which I think is six notes, and they just have a very narrow band pass, then, uh, then you've effectively doubled the fundamental frequency by, by filtering out the fundamental 
of the original signal and just isolating that second harmonic. And of course, the tone changes noticeably, but you, you've doubled it. It's, it's a doubler, it works. And, but it also gives, again, gives the Lowry organs a, a certain tone when you're playing in the range that uses the doubler. You can tell that it's a different tone. Um, now I'm, I'm gonna, so this is the back, this is the Holiday, which is the small spinet that I, I got both of these for free, by the way. Um, the small spinet Holiday and the, the Festival, which was their largest or one of their largest uh, Two bombs that still have the pedal that shifts everything down roughly a semitone. Um, and I say roughly because when you're playing chords, they really go, they really go out when you when you hit that glide button. Um, uh, but another funny thing, so the the Lowry organs have sustain, and the way that they implement this is with special tubes that have extra electrodes, and they then they use neon lamps as as gates to prevent leakage of the tones. And the neon lamps, as you're playing the organ, light up. So this is looking in the, the holiday. Um, this is, I, I'm gonna play two little sections of this um, just because it's kind of cool. You don't normally see this, of course. Here's my mess of there. there we go. I'm gonna skip to here. This is where the lights are off. I guess the point with that is that there are things about these instruments that have no relation to the sound that can be very, very amusing and uh, artistically kind of fun. Uh, I'm going to talk very briefly here. This is kind of the last bit. I think, I think we kind of have about the right amount of time. Electro home organs. This, I want to talk about this specifically because this was a Canadian manufacturer of, of vacuum tube or electron tube organs. Um, Electrohome was in on, on uh, you know, they were in the East and they started producing organs in 1962. And their, their designs were based on an American company called Kinsman, uh, their design. And Kinsman had a, an interesting idea, which, which was to have a divider set with Hartley master oscillators, which are vacuum tube based. And those are, you know, just because those are so stable, but then the dividers are neon bulb. So they are neon bulb relaxation oscillators that are synchronized and those produce uh, rounded sawtooth waves. And so of rounded and arched sawtooth waves, not perfect sawtooth waves, um, but good enough for, for, for this kind of thing. And they're very economical because of course, Neon bulbs much smaller and cheaper than, than vacuum tubes. And also they, they were able to assemble these on circuit boards. So you can see here, the, uh, those are the generator panels, uh, excuse me, in the upper portion. And um, they, you know, each one has, I think like five or six dividers. And uh, these instruments were produced I, I think it was around the late sixties that they actually switched over to transistors. So they actually were tubed for, for longer than usual. Like Lowry switched to transistors in 1964. Um, and Baldwin, I think they might've had even a bit earlier than that, some hybrid instruments. They had instruments where you, you would have transistor tone generation and, and tube amplification, but Electrohome did tubes for, for quite a while, but they also, uh, 
interestingly enough, they outlasted Kinsman. I mean, Kinsman was bought out in 1963, but Electra Home kept making organs pretty well with, with the same principles for quite some time after that. And the other thing about these Electra Home organs is they have a, um, an, a percussion system, as they call it. This is not a drum machine, although some of them do have a drum machine. Some of them, oh geez, I could go on about this. Um, I'll talk about the percussion system first. I, I, I'm talking about sustained percussion, which in these organ terms means that, uh, that the note will sustain for some time after the key is released. And I have two electro home organs that are almost the same thing. One is a concerto A from 1962 and the other is a concerto B comma 007. So they look almost identical, but the amp chassis is quite different in the B and the B also has different behavior of the sustained percussion. So on the A, it's very odd because you have a very gradual attack and then you also have a, uh, a, a, the sustained length varies with the duration of key press. So if you press the key for a very short time, then even if you have the sustain all the way at the max, then it's still, it's still really, uh, really short. Whereas if you hold the key for a long time, then the sustain goes for quite some time. I think they considered this a design flaw and then they fixed, fixed it on the, on the B revision. Um, oh, by the way, you see on the left lower cheek panel, right beside the lower manual, there are two wheels. These are clear plastic uh, wheels that are much like the modulation wheels that you see on synthesizers like, you know, Moke and, and a lot of later stuff. But what these are for, the one on the left is the vibrato depth. So it's kind of like a modulation wheel. And then the one on the right is the sustained length. So you have a continuous control of the, of the sustained length from very short to uh, really, really quite long. Um, and these are lighted because they're clear plastic. They have a bulb, makes them light up. Um, anyway, where was I? Some of these electro home organs were outfitted with drum machines called Rhythm King. And you saw one picture near the very beginning of, of the, of the uh, neon bulb uh, drum pattern matrix thing of, of, of that. And these were basically patterned off of the Wurlitzer Sideman, which was the very first electronic drum machine in 1959. And the Wurlitzer Sideman, it's, it's sort of electromechanical in that the sequencing is, is using a big rotary switch that is driven by a motor, but the actual tone generation is electronic. Um, but Electra Home used this Rhythm King, which I think was first developed for Kinsman. They had it as an optional accessory. And so some of these instruments have these very, very sort of cheesy, but technologically quite cool drum machines. Um, and I'm just going to play a, a little recording here. Uh, this is, so this is a, something that I made with the Electra Home organ playing the melody. Electra Home plays the melody with sustained percussion and relatively short. Um, but it's interesting how the, the attack has a, I, like I've combined the sustained percussion voices with some of the normal voices that are just keyed directly with a switch, keyed as audio. Um, and the, the uh, on, on the, I don't know if you can hear it in stereo, but on, if you're listening on the left channel is going to be the Con 430 tube organ um, that's playing chords. And then on the right channel, there's, there's a Honer pianet, which is an electromechanical instrument, electric piano. But I'll just play a bit of this. Um, yeah, that is about it for, 
for electro home organs. And I think that, let's see, we're, yeah, we're about, about at the time. I'm, I, will, I will mention this, do some shameless self-promoting here. Um, Krasno.ca is my website. And I have, what I've done here, the main things to mention is I've scanned a lot of books and, and schematics and stuff that relate to these instruments. Um, many of these books I found out about online, but there was never any PDF. There were, there were never any scans that I could find. And so I made, I made those. So like, for example, here's, here's a classic, Electronic Organs by Robert L. Eby. Uh, this, one, this one is from 1953, and it talks about a lot of the early stuff, Baldwin, Allen, Kahn, um, Hammond, of course, uh, also Wurlitzer, they made electrostatic reed organs. So if you know about the Wurlitzer electric piano, then they, they also used reeds for organs. Um, stuff like electronic organ handbook, this is another one that's, this is from 1960, so it's somewhat later. Um, this one, if, you, if you're interested in really the design side of things, this is an especially good one, the Electronic Musical Instrument Manual by Alan Douglas. This is a British book. And this one talks a lot about the design of, of this stuff from scratch. It, it, it also talks about commercial instruments, but that's really not, the, uh, not, not so much the emphasis. And then there are these three. These are uh, Richard Dorff's Electronic Musical Instruments, first, second, and third edition. And these, I mean, these are quite different from one another, but especially the, the third edition is totally different. Um, but they also are especially good for designing, getting ideas for how to design instruments um, and also just getting to know certain commercial instruments that were around before synthesizers, before solid state in many cases, um, you know, when, when all this was in a lot of flux and there were many manufacturers, each of which each of whom had their own unique designs that, that you can instantly recognize just by sound alone. You can, you can tell that it was a particular manufacturer's organ because they had all their weird individual quirks. Um, so let's see, I think that, I think that's about it. All right. Well, uh, Jesse, this has been really wonderful. Thank you for enriching us with this really fascinating historic uh, information. Um, I just put in the chat um, a link to Jesse's website that he mentioned. And I also put in the chat a link to um, the National Music Center's Studio Bell in Calgary. That's um, a cool place. Which, uh, yeah, which I want to mention because um, I haven't been there in a while since they've turned it into kind of studios where you can actually go, go and book rooms and record with these things but they have a museum that is unlike any i've seen anywhere in the world really um, of pianos and electronic musical instruments from uh many many of which uh, many of the ones that jesse mentioned are there they have a, they actually have a working on martineau they have a mellotron yep. with a bunch of meltron tapes yeah, um, they, they apparently have a nova chord that is supposed to be chord. functional but yeah it, i've, I've heard, heard it isn't Oh, well, you did? I think when I went, it was before the flooding. I don't know if you remember the flood. Oh, flooding. I, I, don't, I didn't know about that. Yeah, because I'm pretty sure it was working. Anyway, yeah, it was, it's, it's really neat stuff. So um, thanks for, for letting us know about all this. We do, we, we're a little over time, but I do want to take a, a, just a, you know, five minutes or something to, for questions, because I know for everyone who has hung on, uh, I, you know, obviously this talk is a little technical <laughs> and I appreciate your, all your patience on, on this, but it's like, everybody seems really interested. I'm really interested. And um, so I do want to open it up for some quick questions. Um, I will, I will start with one that I'm curious about Jesse, which is um, so, I mean, I'm a, I'm a person who has seen the wave of sort of vintage synthesis sort of ebb and flow over many decades. <laughs> And yes. what's really interesting about what's really interesting about the 21st century here is that um, now we have a kind of wave of vintage analog synthesis that is made up of uh, people who are actually 
using kind of newer versions of analog electronic components that are you know more efficient perhaps than the old capacitors that we always have to replace in these old instruments and and similarly with new kinds of vacuum tubes and stuff like that so i was curious about your opinion about when one is a restoring a historic instrument like a novacord or um uh, you know even a theremin and, and like one of the early rca theremins What's the what's your philosophy about whether or not it's appropriate to seek out the components from the era, which is really hard to do and they may or may not work, versus using the newer components, which are still analog, um, uh, but there's sort of a purist thing in there, and I wondered if you had any opinions about that. I, that's a good question. The um, it depends on the specific kinds of parts because some parts. Uh, do not age or practically do not age like the vacuum tubes themselves uh in many cases there uh, there is no reason to use newer ones even if they are produced because they are vacuum sealed and they don't go bad by sitting around now the thing is you mentioned capacitors of course i don't i'm not really a fan of paper capacitors in in the early days up until around the late 50s these instruments were using paper capacitors. The dielectric is paper, and those degrade in a way that even if they are sitting for, you know, unused, they will go bad. And so you don't really want to actually put those into a device that you're trying to restore. But what, what some people do is if they really don't like the appearance of, of a new component, even if it is functionally perfect for the application, they will sometimes gut the old capacitor, for example, and put the new one inside of it. I've seen this, this done. I've thought about it. I've even tried it myself. It's a pain. And in general, I don't really think it is worth, worth doing unless you want to preserve the thing, not functionally, but physically. You know, if you don't actually care if it works well or not, then you can, then you can, you know, leave the paper caps in. Um, but if you care if it works, then I, I do think that it is a good idea to just replace those with with normal plastic film capacitors that, as far as we can tell, are are also close to ageless. Um, I mean, in the Con 811, for example, the big tube organ that I have. That one was made in 1958, but it uses uh, plastic film capacitors, and they are they test absolutely spot on. Like none of them are leaky; they're all this, the right values and stuff. But none of them have failed at all. So, that is a really funny insider response to that question. <laughs> I appreciate that. That was fun. Um, Okay, uh, well, I, I, I mean, I, of course, could continue to ask questions, but I won't ask any more. Um, I'll, I'll open it up um, to see if anyone has. Okay, there's one question from Daryl. Does Jesse have a particular tube type he prefers the sound of? Well, the question is, is tough because the way that a tube sounds depends much more on the way that the circuit is designed than the type of tube it is, I guess you could say. Um, and type, of course, you could be talking about, you could be talking about um, specific things like 12AX7, or you could be talking about just general categories like, like uh, triodes, pentodes. Um, you could even talk, talk about different manufacturers. I mean, some people go way overboard with the details of you know, they want this company's tube from this particular year because they think it has a certain character, which in general, I don't really find to be the case. I think that as long as the tube is, is good and, uh, and it works in the circuit, then, then usually that's, that's about what you can ask for. Um, but I do, in terms of preferring how they might look or how they might be in terms of in terms of uh, other things than, than sound I, I I tend to like older the oldest tubes like octal tubes and and uh, and early antique based tubes um, they tend to look very nice globed 
globe envelopes and shoulder envelopes. Like this, you know, the shoulder envelope tubes you have in the Nova Cord are very beautiful. Um, but uh, and later on, they just, you know, they just made them tubular. Just they have, you know, flat sides and then a, a evacuation stem at the top. Those are miniature tubes. Oh, I can't hear you. Um, so oh, there sorry we. about that. Yeah, I had myself muted. That's great. Um, so we, I think we have time for one more question. Michael Frischkoff is wondering about if you could say something about the inventors uh, of these. Well, I mean, there's a lot of a lot of inventors, but uh, but in particular, like which instruments um, were kind of best sellers and why? And I have a funny anecdote to tell about that. Um, I worked for a film composer for many years uh, in the New York area um in the early in the early 2000s and um it was interesting because he he during the 60s he was making a lot of film scores and occasionally needed a synthesizer and the one so i i learned in what like working with him and looking at his scores and restoring his music there was lots of onduline in there that he would use. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the it was the most used electronic instrument that he used. And I asked him one day. I was like, "Hey, Frank, I'm just curious. Like, why did you use the onduline so much as an instrument?" And he said, "Well, because in New York City in the 1960s, that was the only electronic synthesizer that you could rent. Um, there were two. Really? There were a couple places that rented instruments, and and the onduline was the one they had, and so that's the one I used. And I was like, wow, that's really fascinating. I wouldn't have thought that at all. But anyway, oh, so either. yeah, so I think Michael's just wondering about a little bit about what what some of the best sellers were and why, and and maybe sure. how that reflects on the inventors. I'll, I'll yeah, why don't I address the inventors first briefly? I mean, as far as Hammond was concerned, I think Lawrence Hammond himself took some part in the invention of some of these instruments, especially the original Hammond organ. But there was another guy there who I think deserves special mention, a guy named John Hannert. Um, so he, he was he's pretty much the one who was responsible for the, the solo box and I think largely the Nova chord and the, um, and the chord organ for sure. Um, but he, I know that he, he has an enormous number of patents to his name. So I, I think the chord organ patent and the solo box patent are, are definitely under his name. And he had, and there were many patents under his name that were never commercially exploited. He had all sorts of weird ideas. Um, there were also, I mean, a lot of these guys, so a lot of these guys were from the US. It was Winston, what was it? Winston Coke in, in, the, in the US who did the, the uh, Baldwin organ. Um, there were also, of course, these French guys, the, you know, Maurice Martineau, who, who created the own, own Martineau, and he, to the end of his life, was, was involved with that project. Um, and he, I mean, he spent a long time working on that. And I, I, it's in, unclear, too, how much he knew about the theremin. Um, it's, it's, it's not certain that he, whether or not he, he kind of copied it or whether he just happened upon the same or very similar idea with the RF oscillators beating, beating together. Um, and then of course there's Leon Theremin who, uh, who was in the Soviet Union to start with and he moved to the US and then I think went back to the Union for reasons that we don't fully understand um, and then reappeared like 30 years later. Um, in terms of which were best sellers, this, it's hard to, well, I, I'll say this. The Hammond organ, of course, is probably the most, the biggest selling instrument of the pre-synthesizer era. Now we didn't really talk about that, but again, that's the, the re, and the reason for that is because it's electromechanical and the Hammond organ was extremely reliable. Um, it never, it could not physically go out of tune because the tone wheels were all geared together um, and as long as the induction motor was synchronized to the AC line, then it was in tune, uh, which, you know, the sync it has a synchronous AC motor. And um, the, in terms of the electronic organs, Baldwin was very successful. I think it also had to do with, with their reliability and also, um, you know, to, to a large degree, these, these were 
bought instead of pipe organs. Um, and of course they were much less expensive than pipe organs. And as long as they could sound about right, then they figured, well, that was, that was good. And Kahn, as far as instruments that were really seriously trying to Im imitate the pipe organ, Kahn did quite well. They sold a lot of, a lot of their bigger models and also a lot of home organs. Um, uh, they, they, and there was also a company called Allen. In fact, Allen is, I think, the only company that's, that still exists. I don't think any of the companies that I talked about really, really still exist. Um, I mean, Hammond doesn't really, it's, yeah, anyway. But, but um, Allen did quite well early on making organs that were quite like cons and having individual oscillators, but that were even more pipe-like and that really were, were sort of cost is no, is no concern instruments. And some of them had ranks of, of tube oscillators that filled entire rooms. Um, and even some of their solid state instruments had ranks of oscillators that filled entire rooms. Um, but you know, that was, that was, they were successful in the sense that they sold a whole bunch, a, a relatively large number of those to a small, number of you know specialized organizations whereas other companies like Lowry Lowry was very successful in selling tons of of their smaller instruments to homes you know they were not successful in in the church field or in the you know really serious you know big organ field they they just made a whole lot of very small inexpensive organs that were very successful um, and and they actually became in the 70s, they became uh, the biggest selling organ manufacturer in the US. Um, they, they outsold Hammond by that point. Um, but by that point, they were also making instruments that were even more, you know, is, again, sort of entertainment devices, you know, <laughs> sort of lots of drum machine stuff, lots of, anyway. Well, well thanks for that. Um... Well, I, I would just want to thank you again. This was really um, fabulous talk. Um, and uh, before, before we applause, <laughs> applaud you, um, I'll mention, uh, I, first, I just want to thank Oliver Rossier and Gail Mandrick uh, and Tom Merklinger, who uh, helped me behind the scenes with all of this. Um, and two events I want to let you all know about, since some of you are still here. Um, Tomorrow night, uh, because we're the Sound Studies Institute, um, so we're not involved in this concert, except that we're always really interested in contemporary music and new sounds. So I wanted to um, just do a plug for the music department's presentation tomorrow night of the um, Experimental Improvisation Ensemble. Um, and I just put a very long, completely impossible to type link in the chat <laughs> that will take you to the Facebook event. Um, uh, that was the quickest thing I could find, um, but it, you can you can go um, and check that out if you'd like. And it, it is it will be a hybrid event, I believe, so it'll be streamed, but you can also attend live. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to mention is the last um, lecture of the term for sound studies is in two weeks, two weeks from now. So uh, we're really excited to bring uh, Julia Bile back. Um, she's going to be giving um, a talk on the regular Qureshi archive project, um, which uh, it should not be missed. So uh, Qureshi is uh, one of the most important people um, in our department, uh, in the music department and in the ethnomusicology area in particular, um, and very, very important in the city of Edmonton. And you'll learn why if you don't already know um, by hearing Julia talk about this really great documentary project. So I hope some of you can make that. That's two weeks from tonight. You can find information about that on the Sound Studies website, uh, soundstudies.ca. Um, and please join our mailing list there. There's information there for that if, you, uh, if you'd like. Um, and uh, finally, um, I'll invite everyone to uh, unmute themselves and turn on their screens and make a bunch of noise for Jesse. Thanks again, everyone. Thanks very much. Have a Thank great you, night. Scott, for Thanks, having Jesse. Me. Bye. Thanks, Jesse. Great. <laughs>